Hello everybody and welcome back to Creation Myths. Today we are going to talk about a creation trick. Today's creation trick is something that creationists do all the time. The thing that we're going to talk about is how they redefine basic terms. What's going on here is that creationists know a lot of the time that like they can't win this or that aspect of the argument using the correct definitions for some really basic terms in evolutionary biology. So instead of fighting it out and losing, they'll just like come up with their own definitions for those terms. So we're going to talk here about a few examples of that. I'm going to tell you some terms that they redefine. I'll tell you the correct definition. I'll tell you why they redefine them, why they can't use the correct definition, and then how creationists try to use their own definitions to their advantage. The point here is you can see these examples, you can know them when you see them in the future, and then call them out and correct them. The first term we're going to talk about here that creationists love to get wrong is fitness. Fitness is obviously a foundational term in the field of evolutionary biology, and in general, kind of the simplest way you can think of it is just reproductive success. You can think about that in absolute terms, or you can think about that in relative terms, right? One individual in a population compared to other members of that population. Now, the specifics are going to vary depending on the organism you're looking at. So, like, for example, my research background is viral evolution. So when I think about fitness, the metric that I used when I was doing my experimental evolution on bacteriophages was doubling time. How long did it take for that population to double in size, right? That's how you measure viral fitness. But if you're looking at other organisms, you're going to use other measures. You could even use something really simple. So like for mammals, for example, a really simple proxy for reproductive success is just how many grandkids do you have? More grandkids means higher fitness. Now, creationists don't like that definition of fitness. They think that is overly simplistic. And they usually talk about this in the context of so-called genetic entropy, which is the extremely wrong idea that there is entropy acting on the genome and it's causing a loss of genomic information over time that is inevitable and you can't recover it and so everything's going to go extinct, right? When they talk about genetic entropy, they talk about a loss of fitness, but they don't use fitness correctly when they're doing that. Instead of the real definition, they're referring to something more like information content or complexity, but it's actually really hard to pin down. I had a really long conversation with Sal Cordova about this exact thing a couple of years ago. He and um, I think John Sanford and uh, Basner and a couple other people, they were uh, co-authors on a book chapter that had to do with fitness. And I spent about an hour and a half talking with Sal about this, trying to hash out the definition of fitness that, that they were proposing in this chapter and I never really got a concrete answer. Now, other creationists are explicit about the reason for redefining fitness. So I want to refer you to this article. This is by uh, Paul Price and Rob Carter, Dr. Rob Carter on creation.com. That's the website for Creation Ministries International. Part of this article was actually in response to me on the internet way back in my pre YouTube days. So they're talking about the definition of fitness in this article, and in the conclusion, they're extremely clear about their motivations. They wrote, only when we insist that the terms of the debate be fair and accurate will we have any chance to clearly communicate the truth of creation and the bankruptcy of Darwinism to the world at large. As we have undertaken to demonstrate here, evolutionists have been guilty of hiding behind the misleading use of the term fitness, which is to say, the correct definition, it is now time for honest scientists to adopt a more realistic, objective look at the parameters of life. So they're saying right here, very openly, we can't win this argument unless we change the definition of fitness. So that's what creationists try to do. The second term I want to touch on here that creationists love to define incorrectly is information. 
Now, there are a lot of ways you could potentially define information in biological systems. You could talk about the number of nucleotides. You could talk about the number of genes. You could talk about the number of functional nucleotides. You can use Shannon information. There's a whole bunch of ways you can do it, and there's no one best way. It's kind of going to depend on the context, but there are ways you can concretely quantify information in biological systems. Creationists care about this because they argue that information only comes from intelligent sources. Now, what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning about the past, is that information, especially in a digital form, always comes from an intelligent source, whether we're talking about a paragraph in a book or a section of software or a hieroglyphic inscription, or even information embedded in a radio signal. Whenever we see information and we trace it back to its ultimate source, we inevitably find a mind, not a material process. Now this is wrong, and I've covered that before. That's linked below along with all the other stuff I'm referring to in this video. But the interesting thing here is that while creationists argue against the real definitions for information, they don't actually have their own that they want to replace it with. And it's not only that they don't have a preferred definition of information, they actually can't provide an alternative definition for information. I actually left a comment on this topic, on that article by Price and Carter that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. They said, in response to my comment right here, information is a metaphysical concept that cannot easily be quantified. And in my more recent conversation with Paul Price on genetic entropy, he said this. As the genetic entropy proponents, right, you and Dr. Sanford and Dr. Carter and anybody else, to quantify the information you say is declining. Yeah. You cannot quantify conceptual information, and that's what we're talking about here. Okay. We're not talking about Shannon there information. There we go. We're not talking about, um, you know... And this is why we wrote the article. It's at creation.com slash new information genetics. And it's it's it I I don't think I we could do a whole lot better job explaining this concept that no, you cannot quantify okay. concepts. I think creationists will eventually have to settle on some definition of information that's vague enough for them to use in the way they want to use it, but is more concrete than what they have now, which is pretty much literally nothing. Because right now, they're only willing to go as far as saying that the correct definitions are wrong and pretty explicitly say they don't have their own definition to replace the ones they think don't work. So how should we handle this? Just keep using the real definitions of information. Whichever concept works best in the context you're using it, use that one. And when creationists want to dispute it, make them come up with their own number. When they can't, we can all move on. The third and final term we'll talk about here is macroevolution. Now, let me start by saying that I dislike the distinction between microevolution and macroevolution. And in my classes, I don't like to use those terms. And the reason for that is having the two different terms gives people the idea that there are kind of two types of evolution. There's microevolution and there's macroevolution, and they're distinct things. But what's actually the case is that it's the same sets of evolutionary processes, just operating over different scales. The actual definition of macroevolution is evolution above the species level. And if you look in different sources or different textbooks, like I have some evolution textbooks right behind me there, if you look at all these different sources, they all say something akin to that right? How do things like speciation and changes above speciation that lead to new groups like new genera or families or higher levels, how do those larger groups, species and above, come about and how do they diverge from each other, right? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about macroevolution. Again, the simplest way to think of this is just evolution above the species level, as opposed to microevolution, which is evolution that occurs within a species or population. So if you've ever heard the, the kind of basic definition for evolution of changes in allele frequencies within a population over generations, that's basically microevolution. And once you get into things like speciation or broader changes, now you're talking about macroevolution. 
Again, those are the real definitions, and you can look those up in like your basic evolutionary biology textbooks. But creationists don't like that, because if you use those definitions, it's really obvious that macroevolution occurs because we can like directly watch it occurring, and we can't have that. So they come up with a whole bunch of different definitions depending on the situation. Sometimes it's going to have to do with development or new body plans. Sometimes it'll have to do with new information or new genes. Sometimes it's going to be all of these things at once. But that's not what macroevolution is, and creationists know that. And we know creationists know that because as soon as you demonstrate the evolution of new genes, new body plans, new developmental patterns, suddenly those things don't count as macroevolution anymore. All right, I think all he has given all evening is examples of what people call microevolution. I think the best definition for macroevolution actually came from a poster on Reddit. And I apologize because I don't remember the source. I went back to try to find it and I couldn't find it. But what this person on Reddit said was microevolution is evolution creationists can't deny. And macroevolution is evolution creationists must deny. This has been the creation trick of redefined basic terms in evolution when you don't like the real definitions. Because creationists know they can't win if you use the terms accurately. So what do they do about it? They change them. But now you know some examples to look out for, so don't let them get away with it. Thank you very much for watching. Before we go, I want to thank my super subscribers, Ian and Charles, for their generosity. Please like this video, leave a comment, subscribe if you're not already a subscriber, share this around, and don't get fooled.